Well, first of all, thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak to all of you today, and thank you to Sarah's uh, people at the transitional justice groups. Uh, this is my first trip to South Korea, so I'm familiar with this place uh, as well. Um, Patrick, I actually don't like math, so I will bring you a different perspective. I don't like math because I'm not good at math. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, give you some background why I decided to come to this work. Uh, you know, I, I left Cambodia as a refugee. I, I survived the killing field, making you like in America, but I decided to return to do this work for a very, very personal reason. So the story perhaps would allow you to understand why I'm here and what I'm doing in Cambodia in regard to the justice issues and memories and the tribunal that perhaps you have heard already. Um, in, it took, the Khmer Rouge, the communists actually exist in Cambodia since 1945, a long, long time ago, but it became active in 1975 when they took over the countries. And uh, in less than four years, about two million people have died of starvation, of forced laborers, of uh, executions, uh, disease, and so forth. Um, so the country is very broken. It's so broken. In Cambodia, from the king down to a farmer in the village, always has someone lost to the communist regime, which we call the Khmer Rouge. So the entire country were completely broken. Uh, imagine that you, you, you took a glass and throw it on the floor, and it's broken. And that's Cambodia. But yet, you know, Cambodia comes from the most beautiful and ancient civilization in Southeast Asia. So I'm sort of wonder whether that such a broken society can be restored, can be returned to the glorious, and can move uh, by turning, uh, you know, being a survivor to educator, by turning atrocity to the beauty, uh, whether that Cambodian can do that. I can, I'll tell you a personal story why. Uh, I have a sister um, at the age of 24, she's a typist. And during the communist movement, we were all evacuated by the train to different parts of the country. Uh, my sister married to a young professor, uh, have three kids, so we all were separated. At one point, uh, you know, in, during the communist regime, perhaps similar to North Korea, you know, usually shortage of food, starvation is took place in the country. So people are stealing, people do things that perhaps not supposed to be doing, but starvation would push you to do certain things that you should not have done. So my brother-in-law actually stole a cucumber from a, um, from the commune's uh, kitchen, you know. During the communist, you eat collectively, you don't eat separately. So he was arrested because he stole a rotten cucumber. During the communist movement, when you commit such a crime, you know, those considered a crime, then you uh, would be put on trial publicly among the villagers. So he was, he was brought into uh, in the middle of the village and hundreds of people were watching him beating up. So he was beat up severely and he died that night. I think he died because he was so upset that, that he being tortured in front of the public, so he died. In the communist movement, when you kill someone that perceive as an enemy of the state, they also would also eliminate those who are connected to someone that will perceive uh, or judge as enemy of the state. So they come after my sister. So they, the prison guard came home and asked my sister whether she eat the rotten cucumber because they couldn't find it. They want to find the evidence. They want to, us to return the rotten cucumber to the commune's uh, kitchen. And my sister denied of eating it. So what they did, they took my sister to uh, a nearby um, hospital and they cut her stomach open. So she died. So when my sister died, they brought both my brother-in-laws and my sister and buried them right behind a local clinic, half buried. So the whole village alerts uh, all of us, myself and also my niece who back then, the oldest one was six years old. So she ran from the unit and looked for the gravesite of her parents, you know, unaware which one is which because the body was swollen and she was a six year, years old kid. You know, so then we all went back home and uh, pretend that nothing happened and move on with their life. 
That night, um, my three other nephew was crying, and one also died because no breast feeding because he was too young to, to live. And the second one also were, were, were exhaust, died of exhaustion because no one around. You're not supposed to look after even your own family member. So the three little kids were left in a little hut and two died one week after. And then the oldest one survived. Uh, so we were concerned, my mother and myself were concerned that she would also have passed away if we, we have to do something. So what we did, uh, we lied to her. She was a six years old kid. We said that, you know, um, actually none of your parents are dead yet. They all went to heaven. And they would return and pick you up later. So you should go to sleep, um, you know, and usually in the Khmeru time, you pretend you're eating something to put you to sleep. So you pretend eating rice, you pretend you're eating chicken, and you go to sleep. That's what I told my niece was six years old. So she stopped crying, uh, and she went to sleep. Uh, and 40 years later, you know, during after the Khmer Rouge uh, collapse, my niece ended up um, moving to America. She's now married and has three children. Uh, my niece sort of questioned me, said, what am I doing? Will the tribunal that I saw advocate would bring back her parents? She pointed out to the Holocaust, she pointed out to Armenia, that genocide took place 100 years ago. For a century, this crime keep happening. What was the point that I'm working so hard to bring all the few perpetrators on trial? So there's no point, there's no way that my niece would even support my own work for the justice of her own sister, her own parent. And she refused to return to Cambodia. Uh, every time during the Christmas time when her kid asking for the grandparent, she would ask the kid to email me in Cambodia. And I, you know, I sort of try to find ways to answer it differently. I don't want to lie to her kid the same way I lied to her 40 years ago again. So she never returned, and one of her daughter actually coming to visit me for the first time since she was born in the state next month. But my niece never returned. I never believed in any process of justice at all. My, my effort in the last 30 years to my niece is nothing. It's useless, it's meaningless. And then, you know, my mother, who now is 89 years old, uh, she lost not just only my sister, also uh, her husband, her parents, her parent-in-laws. All her brother and sister also were executed by the communist regime. She's actually alone. So um, at one point, uh, uh, I was uh, interviewed by um, Christy Annan Bonpo from CNN, and she's interested to speak to my mother. And I, I said, you know, please don't bother her. My mother is a peasant girl, cannot read and write, but you know, she was everything to all of us. And Christy Annan Bonpo asked my mother and put me outside the room of the interview, and I listened to the conversation through the head, headset. She asked my mother, uh, are you proud of your son or what he's been doing for Cambodia, you know, to bring about a process of justice, to educate the young population for the entire country? Would, are you proud of him? And my mother said, uh, I'm very happy that he's safe, he has food to eat. So she tried to lead my mother to say that, you know, I'm very proud of my son, you know, he do justice for the whole world, uh, you know, things like that. But as a mother, you know, in the end of the day, it's all she wants to see that you're being safe and have a good life. So, and then I asked my mother, because during the, that time, after they killed my sister, I also was tortured and put in prison, because I also still picked a mushroom from the right field, and I also got arrested as well to feed one of my, of my pregnant sister. So I was arrested at the age of 14, put in prison with all the adults, and tortured every day there. So I, I actually went back and found all those perpetrators 20 years later. So I asked my mother, um, what do you think of the, all this process now to bring about a justice for our family? And my mother said I, she actually forgave those perpetrators a long, long time. I didn't even realize that until I talked to her 25 years ago. So for my mother, a tribunal is nothing because she's so strongly Buddhist belief and she think that anyone who did harm to her would be punished in the next life. And therefore, there's no point to get even now. And what is the point to get even now is nothing but you know, a horrible history and re returning to all of us. But I disagree with my own mother and my niece. 
So you can see a family that, that are so broken. You know, we three are disagree on how justice is being done for my sister. And I have the right to do this because she's my sister. And my niece, she has the right to disagree because it's her own mother's. And my da mother has her own term that how justice should be done for her own daughter. So we all disagree uh, in the same family for 35 years. So I went separate road. I went out, collect all this information, support a process for tribunal, and try to all do all, all these things that you, perhaps you have heard of it. But in case of my mother and my niece, it's no different. You see that how broken Cambodian is all about. So that become my motivation. I want to do something that my mother would be proud of me, that my niece would be proud of me, what I have done to the family. So I came to this work purely out of personal reason, not as a researcher or people who care about the world or people who care about humanity, purely out of revenge. So I came to this work for purely personal reasons, so it had the impact over how I documented and how I performed the work because it's rather personal. What I did when I first came to conduct this research 25 years ago, I decided to went back to a village where I was tortured. But this time I returned as Yuk Chang. Back then I was a 14 years old skinny boy. Uh, you know, we we'll, we'll suffer, we we'll starve, we we'll forced to work like everybody else. So what I did, I went and looked for the prison guard who arrested me and tortured me and put me in prison. So I found all of them, and we conducted the interview. In our interview process, it's very important. I will explain more how the methodology we use in conducting the interview. So I'm not supposed to even involve because I'm holding the primaries evidence. So therefore, I'm sitting there listening to all the interview conducted by my staff and the five perpetrator. I was extremely upset because the five were so sincere and honest to my staff. You know, I should have been happy that we find the truth. This is what we're looking for uh, before we find information that would support the process of prosecution at the tribunal. But instead, I was very upset. And I actually want them to lie to my staff so that I can pick on them immediately on, on the spot. But in fact, this five man, if you see him today, he's just a poor, skinny farmer living with a poor, a uh, couple skinny buffalo under poverty that you may have heard today in Cambodia. So after the interview, I asked, I cut off the, uh, the tape recording and I came in and asked a question to the five guy, the five prison guard, five former prison guard. And I said, you, do you know me? He said, yes, I know you, Yuk Chang from DC camp. And I said, no, before, a long, long time ago, have you ever met? They said, no. I was confused because I forgot to realize that I was just a 14 years old boy, 25 years. But I keep insisting that they remember me. And then uh, uh, I said, I told them I live here. I said, no, it's impossible, you from the city. I said, no, I lived here before during the communist regime. Uh, I live in this village, actually. And they don't recall you know, who I was then. Then I start to tell him a story that you remember uh, you know, Back then, there's a, as a boy that was arrested and tortured among all the villagers, and his mother was there, and also failed to protect him, he dragged and put in prison for several, several months. You remember that story? And suddenly everybody remembered the story. The whole five former prison guard remember the story. Yeah, we remember that boy. You know, we were the one who were who doing this, you know, because he's, he, he's still mushroom, you know, he, he did all these bad things. So we must do it because it was an order from the superior to, to, uh, to, to clean the society that any crime it was committed, it must be in that order of prosecution. So then I said, the boy is me. Imagine the room was silent. The whole room was, was silent, it's nobody talk. And suddenly each of them uh, asking me whether I want to have lunch, Someone went to pick a coconut drink, and someone offered better if one any gift or souvenir from the village. In case of Cambodia, of culture, of languages, that's apology. You don't have to say it, but those body languages is an act of apology. And I didn't say anything, you know, I, I questioned myself. Maybe I grew out of this culture of apology, unless he asked unless he remembered me, but since they don't remember me, so uh, there's no forgiveness coming out from my mouth. I never say I forgive you. And they never uh, ask for an apology. But we split, we split. 
I left the village and I never thought of them again, ever again, until today. It's just like in Cambodia, you know, there's a Mekong River and Tung Le Sap, and you have to meet, but then you split. So in case of reconciliation, some, in some cases, you must be separated to be, recon to, to be reconciled. So that is the idea that I start the Documentation Center of Cambodia. I want to do this, but to restore my family for reunification, for reconciliation, so that we can move, so that this crime won't be repeated in my country or elsewhere. So my approach, rather than legal approach, but historical approach, so I want to restore the entire broken Cambodia that were distracted by the communist regime in less than four years. To the whole country were destroyed. But yet I realized that without prosecution, then it would be difficult to reconcile because you don't have to be a lawyer to understand when somebody harmed your family member, when somebody uh, put you in prison without a fair trial. You have the instinct as human being, like my mother, she, she's a poor peasant girl without any education, but she knows what is right, what is wrong. And that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm side with, the people themselves. So I want so much to restore such a divided society back to the glorious country that we lived through a thousand years ago. So then I realized also without justice, then uh, reconciliation would be impossible in the case of Cambodia. So I advocate the tribunal. I want to have a tribunal knowing that it won't be a perfect tribunal, and any form of tribunal won't be bring a full justice to any victim around the world. So I began the documentation center in such an approach, Play, put history in a special role to restore a broken society using the legal prosecution as a mean, as a foundation to move on. So from day one, as I start the documentation center in Cambodia, I advocate a process of justice. So I fought for it, you know. And one of my job, I have to remind myself, I'm not a prosecutor. I don't have to be a prosecutor to collect all this information to bring out the truth so that a court of law can judge those who are most responsible. That commit crime against my brother-in-law, my sister and my other, and the entire population of Cambodia. So I know myself, I, I present myself in a position to assist any court of law that would look into these cases and I'm here, uh, that I'm with them. So I started the documentation center in that kind of understanding. And therefore, all of our material, you know, I have the, I have the ambition to try to get something that people do not have the ability to access to it. And that's why the DCK becomes so uniqueness because we, the way I approach this, because I want to understand the whole picture, basically to determine what happened in the past, rather than going out looking for a piece of evidence to support the prosecution. So that's my approach. And therefore, the way I set up the database, I, the way I set up the forensic uh, evidence, the way I set up the interview, the way I set up the uh, photographics uh, or um, the, the film, it, it's very uniquely designed based on my personal visit to ICTY, to Bosnia, to many places. So I've been around. I talked to this Ben Tutu about Truth Commission, for example, to Alex Borain. I went to ICTJ. So I want Cambodian to be a new model, to be a new solution to all the problems, uh, the, to the past atrocity. I don't want to use the same model because the same model has been using, but crime has been repeating. Crime does not end at a tribunal. It's continue. And I want my work to be continue and parallel to the crime that also continue to harm all of us. So that's a different approach. So, so I define uh, the center in, three, in two objectives. I call it justice and memory. I want justice, but I also want people to remember. Because to me, remember also is justice. Uh, if you, uh, knowing that you know, a tribunal won't bring a full history to the population. So I want people to continue to remember, to learn. Uh, not to be uh, politicized, but to learn scientifically, to, to have a dialogue you know, in the whole society. So the documentation started in 1995, actually as a um, 
field office of Yale University. So I'm a team from the States uh, that compete with others to get a small grant from U.S. State Department after the uh, U.S. Uh, Congress passed a Genocide Justice Act in 1994, which signed into law by Bill Clinton, which requires State Department to establish an Office of Investigation of the crime was committed uh, by the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. So that's how it started. But two years later, I localized it because being a documentation center of Cambodia and has been operated in the last 20 years. So through the course of work, uh, I, uh, I, I conclude that there are so many challenges. Uh, I have heard Patrick Ball, I, I, he gave a very great answer. You know. Even though I, long, I don't like mass, I've been convinced today to love mass today. So he convinced me. But my approach is purely story, people's story. That's important to me, not number. I did also mapping project. I also use statistic. But for me, as a secondary sources, for me, it's people's story, human story. Everyone, every person, you know, it it's, must be respected the right to life. And no one has the right to harm even a person because it's not belong to you. So my approach is storytelling. So, uh, but through all this work, I find that documentation actually is a political act. Documentation, not just go there and pick a piece of paper, because you have to question why you're doing this for whom, and that become political. In case of Cambodia, in the last hundred years, you know, since the uh, French colonization, you know, we have French control us for 98 years. We have the Vietnam War. We have bombardment. We have uh, genocide. We have Vietnam invasion. We have the internal, international intervention. Only in 1998 that Cambodia feel as a country. Some may think that the Khmer Rouge lasts only for four years, but in, in fact, we've been through a century of, of violence in Cambodia, a century of violence since the Angkor was abandoned in the 19th century. So that Cambodia case is very complex. But then I decided to focus on the Khmer Rouge. Why? Because that's the most grave human rights violation in human history. So when you do documentation, you can't lose everything because as you always can find something that also violate human rights, even before or even today. So you have to find a very logical explanation why you're doing this and for whom and why, and therefore become political. So by doing this, you cannot avoid being political yourself. And you know, people say politicians are bad people, but you need good politicians, and you cannot avoid being political. So I'm being very political myself. So I took a position, and I work with everybody. I work with, uh, you, with America, with Swedish, with the Dutch, with Vietnam, with La, with China, with no, I work with everybody. I, at the same time, also, I talk to everyone, you know, victim and perpetrator, everybody. So that's my approach to engage, to make a difference, rather than stay opposition and make a difference. So that's a different approach. Perhaps it worked in Cambodian context, but this is what I did. So I, I summarize in, in three challenges. One is political challenge, because when you do any documentation, then you will perhaps uh, send a signal to the country who support that regime in some way, directly or indirectly. In case of North Korea, they have their own friend too. You know, so anyone who support North Korea may not perhaps support your initiative. And you cannot blame them because it's, it's relevant. And therefore, uh, you have to find someone that support you. And you cannot uh, please everybody. And you know, politically, it, uh, you have to ch be challenged. You know, in case of Cambodia, I, mean, I also face a lot of challenging because when I start to do documentation in Cambodia, people point to America who bombed Cambodia. And they look at this as a U US mess. So clean it up. So all Europeans don't come near at all. All European countries never go near the documentation of genocide in Cambodia, at, even Germany. Even Germany never come near at all. You know, you might imagine that German would come first because of their own history, never came near. I can understand Japan, who doesn't want to come near to this case because of their own war crime in their own home country, but Germany or other European didn't come near at all. So I was solo, I was, was you know, isolated politically. So, so you are the only one because they passed its own Justice Act, so that a requirement by the Congress for the State Department to implement a piece of law. So that's how it started. 
So, you know, you, you would face this. Uh, and secondly, also, you would face network. I agree with Patrick that you want everyone to do documentation. You know, even I worked in Iraq a little bit in 2004 myself. But, you know, uh, it's, it's everyone have their own, uh, their own agenda, their own objective. In terms of data, is interested to have everyone doing this. But to create a network support such a, uh, such a political issue is difficult. And you have to be selective. Someone may disagree with you, someone may agree with you. So you don't have to worry if there's some opposition, actually make you, do strong, make you stronger. In case of Cambodia, people cannot link between the current human rights violation or corruption or land grabbing to the Khmer Rouge violation. They think that those are two separate issues. But in any post-conflict society, there's interconnected between the two. You cannot talk about the current human rights violation without looking at the past abuse that took place before a post-regime that came to exist. But usually among the network, among the NGO, there's a split. How to look at, how to define what is human rights violation. And then that has been a problem. So any documentation about past abuse is relevant to the contemporary human rights violation. And you must find the link. And that is the tricky part for any NGO doing documentation on this topic. So that is what is very important. And secondly, also, when you start to doing this, uh, you know, you, you sometimes, uh, in, in my case, uh, I'm a bit arrogant. I do my way. Uh, you don't join it, then you out. So sometimes you have to be like taking the lead, you know, because you don't have time to explain. You have to think about your limitation, your resources. Sometimes you do your best, you know, as long as you're sincere, you're honest to your objective, I think just do it. Because if you try to engage, uh, it would, would take a long, long time. So you might make some mistake, but that's what you would learn. And if you know you're making mistakes, you're still doing it, it's okay too. Uh, you know, I, I quote one of the famous uh, American novelist, uh, William Faulkner. He said that the past never been a past. We always, it's always with us today. So, you know, I don't look at this as a past crime as 60 years ago. It's just like current because it's, it's just a link to it. So my recommendation when it comes to network, you have to move and you have to be selective. Just like you pick someone to marry with, you know, you have to select, be selective. You can't marry to everybody. So you pick someone and you think you can be a partner and just move and do it. And they might do it a, a, a different way and that's okay too. So at the end, you will meet and you can support a process that perhaps you share in common for justice. The last thing is resources. You know, Patrick has made a very clear presentation. They're very expensive to have a proper technology, uh, data, you know, very expensive and it really would be very difficult to get a perfect data and very expensive and usually don't know, don't fund something that you don't see the impact immediately. You know, to fund a, the microfilm, digitization, database, boring, but the most expensive one resources, very expensive. And because you don't have good political net, you, because you're not, if you're not political, if you're not selective, you also don't have the resource. So you must be political, you must be selective, then you have the resource. So that's sort of my experience uh, in terms of challenging that, that, that I can never avoid. It keeps repeating all the time, keep repeating. Why? Because genocide, because crime against humanity is a political act. It will always happen in the next century uh, because it's committed by people, committed by the state. So I think that my approach, uh, you know, uh, for example, like the tribunals, with genocide education, in replacement of the Truth Commission, with the uh, permanent research on genocide and mass atrocity in South Asia, those are actually designed specifically to making sure that Cambodia return to the glory. They're making sure that we all can move on and provide a certain foundation so that we can put all these small, small broken pieces together in some way. And that is the reality that it can never be the same, but make all your effort and move rather than living with it. So that is Cambodian context. Uh, that's how I s start my documentation. It's how I approach it. And perhaps, you know, there's some perceived as success, uh, some perceived as some sort of failure, but at least 
a tribunal, at least uh, a process itself, have pushed the entire country to deal with the past in the eye of the international community. And that for me, that's the greatest effort that I have made so far for my mother. Thank you.